All right, y'all, so I'm back at y'all again with another video. Go ahead and finishing up and making the connections with the real children of Mizraim in modern-day time. If you look at Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and modern-day East Africa, it links up with ancient Egypt. Because you got to think about it. The Egyptians look just like the Hebrews. Moses passed as the Egyptian, and they thought that Paul was the Egyptian. So the real children of Israel are still black today, we know better as the Negroes scattered to the four corners of the earth. West Africans, such as Nigerians, Ghana, like a lot of West Africa, and what we know is West Africa today are where a lot of Hebrews are at. Because most of the Hebrews are, scat are still scattered throughout Africa. Most of the Hebrews are. The only tribe that came to America was really the tribe of Judah in the southern kingdom. So Judah is in America and Jamaica and all these islands and Brazil, stuff like that. That's the tribe of Judah. But we are all Hebrews, though. And I know a lot of people are confused when they see this right now because a lot of people were lied to with Hollywood whitewashing our history and the scriptures. When you look at Joseph King of Dreams, that was all black people. There was no white people in Egypt. Egypt was in Africa. The maps, they lied about the maps. And not only that, but they put it in the movies in Hollywood. The ones, the same, the same devils that lied to you about the true color of the Bible, the people of the Bible, and not only the people of the Bible, but the children of Mizraim too, the Egyptians, because they look just alike. So they had to lie and make a, you know what I'm saying, a different image when talking about both nations, because both nations were black people. But yeah, modern day time, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania links up with ancient Egypt. I got videos to prove it on that, and I got videos to prove that they lied about the mouse. So let's get it. All right, now when speaking about Africa and speaking about the locations that they show us when we look at the maps of Africa today, they lied about a lot of nations and a lot of countries being in a location where they're supposed to be at. They turned the whole continent really upside down and just downplayed the size of the continent. And Hollywood is very clever and they let you know it's a woman of message. Watch this. ...and continents. Are you saying the map is wrong? Oh dear, yes. Now look at Greenland. Okay. Now look at Africa. Okay. The two land masses appear to be roughly the same size. Yes. Would it blow your mind if I told you that Africa is in reality 14 times larger? Yes. Here we have Europe drawn considerably larger than South America. When it's 6.9 million square miles, South America is almost double the size of Europe's 3.8 million. Alaska appears three times as large as Mexico when Mexico is larger by 0.1 million square miles. Germany appears in the middle of the map when it's in the northernmost quarter of the Earth. Wait, wait. Relative size is one thing, but you're telling me that Germany isn't where we think it is? Nothing is where you think it is. Where is it? I'm glad you asked. I know. When speaking of children of Mizraim, his name is translated Egypt in English. It's, it means red soil or soil red, Coptic land. So Egypt, the Egyptians, they was made of the soil, just like the Hebrews were made from the earth. God for a man from the earth or the ground, from the dirt or the ground. So as you can see in this picture, this guy that's sitting on the car, he's from Kenya, from that area. And as you can see, he has the same color as the ground, made from the earth. Mizraim, red soil. All right, so what y'all looking at right now is a modern-day Tanzanian woman. As you can see, she looks just like any other Hebrew woman right here in America or in West Africa. You can tell no difference. The Egyptians look just like the Hebrews. So as you can see, she still got a little bit of her culture. But, yeah, man, East Africa as a whole, that land over there is where modern-day Egypt at. It's tough and cut to the world Yeah, I make my mama proud Uganda, Tanzania to the world yeah. You know how we do it Rose so red My issue ya kinu na te Kenya Te Kenya, te Kenya Bila kupamba na wezi Kupenya, kupenya, kupenya Kupenya, kupenya, kupenya Kupenya, familia Kupenya, kupenya, kupenya Kupenya, kupenya, kupenya Kupenya, kupenya, kupenya Down through the ages, the inhabitants of ancient civilizations have tried to predict the future. Delphi in Greece is an example of such a desire. 
You know, famous people like Alexander the Great and the Roman Emperor Nero consulted the Oracle of Delphi so they could know the future. The trouble is, the predictions were not always clear or they were just plain wrong. So can we really know the future? A source that claims to be able to predict future events would need to exhibit two things if you were going to put your trust in it. Number one, you'd want historical accuracy, meaning it's not founded on myths, legends and fairy tales. And secondly, you need a proven track record of fulfilled predictions. Now, some people say that this book, the Bible, is a trustworthy source, but is it? Let's go to ancient Egypt to see the evidence, first of all, for its historical accuracy. The biblical story of Joseph explains how he became a slave of the Egyptians. And during his time there, Egypt went through a devastating seven year famine. Now, recent ice cores found in Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania, which is the mountain which supplies the Nile with its waters, have revealed that a drought did take place around 3,600 years ago, around the time the Bible sets Joseph's story. So here you see we have modern science validating the account of Joseph written in ancient manuscripts thousands of years ago. The Bible documents the story of Moses and the Exodus and of the ten plagues that devastated the land of Egypt. The Leiden National Museum of Antiquities in Holland houses the Ipawur Papyrus, which was written in the 13th century BC. That's about 100 to 200 years after the Exodus. This papyrus describes a series of catastrophic events very similar to the Bible's ten plagues. This time, you see, archaeology validates the accuracy of the account found in these pages. The Bible informs us that around 600 BC, Pharaoh Necho of Egypt was defeated at Carchemish by the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. Now, this is what it says. Concerning the army of Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, which was by the river Euphrates in Carchemish, and which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, defeated in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. Now, the Babylonian chronicle in the British Museum agrees with the biblical record of the defeat of Necho at Carchemish by Nebuchadnezzar. So not only is the Bible accurate in what it records about ancient Egypt, but its predictions we're going to discover about Egypt reveal it has a proven track record of fulfilled predictions. One of the Bible's predictions was about Memphis. Now, Memphis or Noph, as it was called in ancient times, was the capital of Egypt for some 500 years. Now, the Egyptians worshipped some 2,000 gods, and Memphis was also a centre of this idolatry. Around 600 BC, a prophet called Ezekiel, whose writings are found in the Bible, made this incredible prediction about the idols of Memphis or Noph. Thus says the Lord God, I will also destroy the idols and cause the images to cease from Noph. But that's not all. Around the same time, at 600 BC, another biblical writer and prophet called Jeremiah made this amazing prediction. O daughter dwelling in Egypt, prepare yourself to go into captivity for Noph shall be waste and desolate without inhabitant. Every time I take a group of people to Memphis in Egypt, I'm sure some of them wonder why I bring them to this place in which just a few ruins are visible. In fact, the best thing in Memphis is this alabaster sphinx. But you see, that's the whole point of coming here. Just as the Bible predicted, this place has been laid waste. In fact, the Egyptologist Amelia Edwards said this about the city of Memphis. Where are the stately ruins which even in the Middle Ages extended over the space of half a day's journey in each direction? One can hardly believe that a great city flourished on this spot or understand how it should have been effaced so completely. And what about the idols of Memphis which were once so abundant here? Well, most of them have gone. Only a few remain and most of these are broken. You see, the prophecies of the Bible are absolutely dependable. Time and time again, the words contained within these pages have been validated as the most reliable source for knowing the future. All right, so as y'all can see, the modern day Egyptian look just like the modern day Hebrew. We got a Hamite on the left, Egyptian known today as Kenya, as Kenyans or whatever you want to call it, East Africans. And you got the Hebrew on the right, known as African-American or Jamaican or African diaspora. 
on the right, and he's the real Hebrew. As you can see, they look just alike, but you still can tell the difference in the two. There is a difference in the two. But as you can see, they do look alike physically on the outside. So, yeah, man, modern-day Hebrews and modern-day Egyptians look just alike. They both are black people. That's why Hollywood had to lie. They had to change this thing up. And as you can see, to this day, they still look alike. All right, y'all, so I'm going to add a quick clip to this. And it's just showing y'all how, how Hollywood took our story and turned it into a whole other thing. And they whitewashed it out. But they still let you know subliminally just with this cover alone that the Egyptians and the Hebrews were a black people. They took our story and changed it, man. So they know the truth, man. But just, just catch it, though. Not only that, but then right here in the same scene, they show you that Joseph's wife was black. She was an Egyptian. So just pay attention to the whole scene, man. Just... Watch. Here you go. Who's next? We are, my lord. You are not Egyptian. No, sir. My brothers and I have traveled far from okay. Cain. Joseph, what's wrong? Nothing. Well, look at you. You're shaking. It, just, it, must, it must be the sun. I'll, I'll be fine. Please. Our wives and children are hungry. I'm sorry, but you haven't contributed to our supply. We don't ask for charity. We'll pay you with silver. How many of you are there? There are 12 of us. 10 of us here. At home, we have our father and youngest brother. Very well. Give them nothing! Ten foreigners asking for grain. No ties to Egypt. Are you thieves hoping to see where we store our grain? Spies? I don't know what you are, but I don't believe your story. Your Excellency, everything we say is true. I, I swear it. Then prove it. Produce this youngest brother. But why? What would that prove? That you're not lying. If you're telling the truth, I'll let you buy all the grain you want. Until then, arrest this one. We'll hold him until you produce this youngest brother. Take him. Come on. Stop. Judah! Oh, help me! Go! No. Let's go! No. Joseph, what are you doing? They're just trying to feed their families. They're thieves, here to steal our grain. They needed food, and they were prepared to pay for it. How can you say they're thieves? They've done nothing to you. <sighs> nothing. <sighs> they're my brothers. What? They sold me. They sold me into slavery. They took me away from my home. I never got to say goodbye to my mother. I never got to see my father grow old. Joseph, I, I didn't know. You're here now. You have a home, a, a wife who loves you. Everything you could want. No, not everything. But Joseph ended up being in Mizraim. Now, everybody knows ancient Egypt. All you got to do is go back and look at the hieroglyphics. Tells you everything you need to know. Go look at the um, statues, the sphinxes, the whole culture of it. It's obvious that those ancient Egyptians had big lips like Pastor Downs, wide noses like Pastor Down, and they look just like some of my relatives, period, point blank. Well, what happens is white people get upset because then if you say that, then that excludes them from being part of the original family of young. And that's just a fact. So they've come up with ways to deal with you wisely. All of you out there in the world. Why is it too painful to acknowledge the truth? What is it about it? Uh, and, and why is it that some things is comfortable for us to talk about and other things is not comfortable? Facts. Jesus was a black man. How you know that? History proves it out. And even more than anything, you people who say you believe in the Bible, I told you, most of you people would rather choke on your tongue and your spit and your saliva, your whole nine yards, than to admit that Jesus was a black man. I live in a, 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 a county up here. These people damn sure ain't going to serve no black Jesus. I'm telling you that right now. Um, and that's just all there is to it. They too racist to serve a black Jesus. They can't even acknowledge that he was black.
Because if they acknowledge that he was black, that means they have to change their attitude towards me. Ooh, it's getting hot in here, ain't it? Joseph ended up in Egypt, became, look at this, Zephaniah Paneath, second in command, only under Pharaoh in all of Egypt of Mizraim. His brothers, when they got there, if Joseph was a white man, and we all know that Egypt culturally was black, period. I mean black, period. You people are confused because after the conquest of the Europeans, Alexander the Greek, killing all the men in, the, in the, what is commonly called the Middle East, raping the women, stealing the children and making boy lovers out of them and everything else, and, 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 and then straightening out the majority of the hair of all the Arabs, people or the Palestinians that you call them today and all these other people in this land, you think that you, you, you just fast forward to today and you say that's what Jesus looked like. And you have no ability whatsoever at all to use any discernment to go back. Anyway, Zephaniah Panay of Joseph or Joseph, second in command. If he was a white man and if Israel was white, boy, guess what? Ooh-wee. They'd have turned around and his brothers would have said, look, look at Joseph up there. I know that that's Joseph up there. He's second in command. They would have recognized him right off the bat. Only one problem, though. They couldn't recognize Joseph. You know why? Because the Israelites look just like the Egyptians. Oh, they were different nations, but they look just like the Egyptians. Moses was raised and reared, even though he was a Hebrew, mm. in Mizraim. I, I know you folks hate this, but I might as well hey, tell the truth. There were no white people in Egypt. And Moses damn so wasn't white. I don't care what Hollywood paints and what Charlton Heston and them is trying to represent. It's a lie. And and you people need to, I'm telling you, you, you need to be careful to see if you are representing the father of lies when you cannot support and honor and defend the truth. You got personal problems in your heart. And you think that because your mental sin and the truth that you want to acknowledge is going to change the fact when you see the most high come through those skies and start burning the hell out of all this earth, you're going to find out and you're going to be utterly amazed and surprised when you see how he looks. If you want to know how he looks, go read Revelation, the first chapter. And to get it in order and context, in context, read read chapter one of Revelation, verses 10 through 15, to get in context, and you're going to find out what Jesus looks like. Uh, Daniel also told you what it looked like, too. But anyway, Moses is in Mizraim, right? And and Moses is is uh, was a Hebrew, but he was raised as an Egyptian, Egyptian prince. Man, isn't that something? Woo! Not only that, the prophecy says in Hosea 11, out of Egypt, I've called my son. You know who that was? That was Jesus, who you call Jesus. That was Jesus. Jesus, Joseph, and Miriam, you call Mary. Her name was Miriam. His name was Yosef and not Joseph. Including, you know, it's amazing when you come think about this. All of, with this European translation, all of the disciples, all of the Israelites, with exception of the Old Testament. When you look at the New Testament, all of them have European names. You know his name was no damn Paul. His name wasn't Jesus. His name wasn't no Matthew. There was no Mark, no Luke, and no John. <laughs> you people are amazing, boy. You're amazing. Ha! Huh. So anyway, they took Jesus and they took him into Mizraim until the death of Herod. Why did they go and turn and go into Egypt? Because Egypt at that time was black. They were black. They could hide amongst the people, blend right in. If Jesus was white, he'd have stuck out like a soul thumb, just like Joseph, just like Moses, and just like Paul. Paul, who you Christians love. nine he says that the people from Ethiopia and Egypt had a power that was boundless limitless without limit and that was written in 714 BC right around the same time that Isaiah 18 was written so what we're dealing with here is that we're dealing with a, a group of people black people from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia 
that uh, were basically presidents of the planet, if you will. Uh, people who were in world domination. As three-fifths of human beings uh, viewed as animals, viewed as, viewed as tools to build the dreams of the Europeans. Of people with clear affluent features, nose, a profile, and it was just incontrovertible. The facts, the reality that black people had designed this civilization. Because there were white brothers really intensely fighting this thing called slavery. And they were pushing for the, the liberation of the black man, condemning the, the, the trade itself and, and freeing slaves in America. And they were torn. And so you can see where the impetus and the need to uh, formulate rationalizations for this developed. What to do? What are the anthropologists and archaeologists going to do in dealing with this information? And that is what I believe what sponsored, uh, maybe consciously in some cases, unconsciously in other cases, what we could call the cover-up. The cover-up of the accomplishments of black people. Um, uh, Chancellor Williams wrote a book called The Destruction of Black Civilization. And in this book, he outlines seven points as to why he feels that there was a cover-up. Ignore, just refuse to publish any facts of African history that don't go along with our racial theories. We need to create religious and scientific doctrine so that African slavery won't appear that bad after all. What we need to do is flood the world with new African histories that contain our European perspectives only. Start renaming people and places. Replace African names with Arabic and European names. This will disguise their true black identity. Let's change the criteria for defining race. For example, one drop of Negro blood in America makes you a Negro, no matter how light the skin. 
Yes, when reporting ancient African history, reverse the standard. No matter how dark the skin, woolly the hair, or thick the lips, you don't have to be a Negro. When black contribution to civilization is too obvious, let's find a way to attribute it to outside white influences. When all the ancient historians contradict your theory, we'll just discredit them. Chancellor Williams was a scholar, and we feel that his observations have a lot of merit to them. But there are, there are his personal observations. Talk about the, the rewriting of history. Um, we have to set that in the context that we're talking about during the 1800s is when this started. We're not really talking about contemporary scholars um, primarily when dealing with this subject. You could not go from Egypt being a Negro civilization to being a white civilization. 